Hello, my name is Zia, and I have a little problem I'd like to give you. Two months ago, there were 1,500 people in a room at a hotel in Toronto, Canada, seated in almost total silence. Suddenly, fire alarm bells started going off in all directions. But instead of a mad rush for the exits, apart from a few irritated looks and turned heads, nobody moved. The question I have for you is, why? Well, as some of you may have guessed, there was a bridge tournament going on, and there could be an avalanche or an earthquake, let alone a small thing like a fire, and a real bridge player would never get up in the middle of a hand. Now, if you're a bridge player, you would not be all at all surprised at that story. But if you're not, you're probably thinking, who the hell is this crazy guy, and I'm sure that I made up the story. Well, I didn't. You see, I was one of the 1,500, and I didn't move either. Now, there are some of you out there for whom the word finesse relates to the correct way in which you might hold a knife and fork, for whom pass is what you make to a pretty girl at a dinner party, and squeeze, squeeze is a term reserved for a painful hold described by commentators at a wrestling match, perhaps. But to others, these words are quite, quite different, because they're bridge terms. And to them, to bridge players, they conjure up hours of involvement, pleasure and fun. In other words, the game of bridge. There are a lot of preconceived notions about bridge players. The first, and most common, is that bridge players are all slightly unbalanced people, very boring, who for some reason, best known to themselves, spend forever playing around with little pieces of cardboard paper. Well, I have to say, that they're absolutely right. We are all crazy. But let me add that we are having a great time in our craziness, and I, for one, would hate to be sane. Stay with me for a few weeks, and there's a very good chance that you'll end up crazy as well, and probably loving every moment of it. In the next few weeks, we aim to have a series designed to appeal to all sorts of bridge players, both beginners and those who have been further along the road. We hope you're all going to have something that will interest you. Meanwhile, another preconception is that bridge players are all totally boring with looks that fit that image. Now that is totally wrong. But rather than let me tell you that, let me introduce you to a friend of mine, Michelle Handley. Michelle will be helping me to present the, the, the series to you. Hi, Michelle. And before you start betting that she's a trained actress, let me assure you she's a top bridge player who has represented England in international tournaments. She's a real tigress at the table, and if you don't believe me, try playing a rubber against her sometime and see for yourself. Michelle, how did you get involved? You don't look like a bridge player. You don't look like what the world thinks of as a bridge player. How did you get into this game? I was going out with a chap, and he knew I was very into games, so he said to me, why don't I teach you bridge? And I thought, ah, oh. <laughs> not very exciting. And then I said, okay, come on, let's have a go. So um, I had a book, and I was learning a little every day, and then suddenly I just got really involved, and he, he was teaching me, and I was going to a club and playing, and towards the end it was getting that that was all I was looking forward to. In the evening going to play, I was playing five times a week, I was dreaming about bridge, I was hassling people for games, talking about it the whole time. It, it just, it was a pure addiction. You mean you caught the bug? I did. Now, people always seem to say that, oh, whatever you do, when you play bridge, don't play with your boyfriend or don't play with your husband, but you seem to have done both. Your boyfriend became your husband while you were playing bridge together. Did that bother you? Did it affect you? Um, well, of course, you're very personal with somebody, and they can really tell you if you're being a moron, which he did several <laughs> times and still does. And now, of course, it's a little more tricky to take. But, I mean, it was so frustrating because when you learn, simple things take so long to sink in. And he was bashing his head against a brick wall. So now we don't actually play, but the tears at least have stopped. Well, I like that. In fact, I hope that over the next few weeks, we're going to have quite a few of our viewers getting involved in the game, just as you did. Now... What we want to do to help you at home is to reproduce some of the bridge games or the antics that go on every week at your house. And to do that, we've called a few of our friends here. Four of them who are in different categories of bridge, mostly but quite elementary. And we want that while they play here, that you identify with their problems 
maybe see some of the arguments that go on, see some of the things that you do at home that you shouldn't do, and learn as they hopefully will learn as well. And as I go over to meet them, perhaps you, Michelle, will give the audience an idea of what the basics and how you start when you get down and sit down in a bridge game is all about. I'd be delighted, sir. You sit down at the bridge table and you cut for partners. The two highest play together with, and the two lowest play together. And the player who draws the highest card is given the choice of seat and is the first to deal the cards. Incidentally, the seats at the bridge table are usually designated by the points of the compass, north, south, east, west. The deal always proceeds in a clockwise direction, beginning with the player on your left, and the last card must be the dealer's. And now let's rejoin Zia. Well, here we are at the bridge table, and now it's time for you to meet some of our guests. First, Joan. Joan, you've been playing bridge quite long, but you're not a very regular player. No, I go to a bridge class once a week and play with my friends about once a fortnight. Okay, and Cheryl, I think you play more regularly. Yes, indeed. I play at least three times a week. I'm also getting taught at the moment. I am, the more bridge that I play, the better for me. So you're one of us addicts, huh? Indeed. David, how long have you been playing? I've been playing now for a few years. And you're quite advanced, I believe, now. Uh, I don't know about being advanced, but I, I, I play at least twice a week. Okay, very good. And now, our uh, old man of the group, Dermot, who most people think looks very young, but is actually about 55 years old. <laughs> and he just takes bridge to keep him young. No, actually, Dermot, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. And I, I believe you also, you're a bit of a sportsman, and you're, you play football as well? Yes. Isn't it rare for someone to play something like football and bridge as well? Not really. You need exercise to keep you fit, and the bridge is good fun. Bridge is good fun as well, so I'm glad you like that. Well, you're going to be a star by the end of the show, so just be ready. Now, as you remember, Michelle talked earlier about the points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. Now, here we have a contract. Joan, what is the contract? Four hearts. And now, Joan is the declarer, and her partner, Dermot, is the dummy. For the sake of our program and for the sake of showing you how we're going to display these on the board, the graphics, we're going to keep South as the declarer. And in this instance, Joan is the declarer. She is South. The dummy is going to be North. Sorry, Dermot, you're the dummy this time. Maybe next time not. And the dummy will be North. The defenders, East, here Cheryl, West, David. So this will be a regular theme in the discussion of the game. North, the dummy, south, the declarer, east and west, the defenders. And if you bear that in mind, you'll be able to easily identify what we're going to be doing throughout the programs. Now, why don't you guys get on with the game, and I'm going to go and talk back to Michelle. We saw there that Joan was declarer in a contract of four hearts. During the bidding stage, she and her partner Dermot announced, in the language of bridge, that they could take ten tricks with hearts as trumps. The lowest contract is at the one level, seven tricks, and the highest at the seven level, thirteen tricks. The contract is at the four level, so Joan must take ten tricks to make the contract. The defenders need four tricks to defeat the contract. The contract is four hearts, so hearts is the trump suit. Well, it's time we got into the meat of the game. And, as we said before, bridge is divided between two main parts, bidding and play. And now, I think we should start with bidding, because that's where bridge does start with. And a lot of people, both beginners and players who have played for quite a long time, are often intimidated by the bidding and worried that they can't really handle the bidding in a way that their partner is on the same wavelength as them, and they make bids which end up in tri terrible disasters on the table. And actually, this shouldn't happen, because bidding is probably the most simple part of the game that requires no more than a little bit of logic and a little bit of clear-headedness. In principle, what you are trying to do when you bid is something you should always remember. And what you are trying to do is tell your partner exactly what you're holding in your hand. Except where you would normally in English say, partner, I've got spades, hearts, diamonds and clouds and better spades and less diamonds and so many points in a big hand or a small hand, Unfortunately, those words you can't use, but you can be limited to the words which I call the language of bridge. Now that sounds already complicated, but it isn't because the language of bridge, unlike the language of French or German or any other language, is limited to a very, very few words. In fact, 
I could tell them to in a few seconds. The numbers, one to seven, that's not too tough. The suits, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, four suits, that's not too tough to remember, is it? And a few other bits, pass, double, redouble. How wrong can you go with just that vocabulary? Well, unfortunately, there is still room. But if you understand that every time you pick up your hand, as soon as possible, you tell your partner, this is what I hold, one spade, meaning partner, I have an opening bid and spades, not complicated, partner responds, two hearts, I've got some hearts and uh, values to respond. He's telling you, you're telling him, as soon as possible you get to the right contract and that's the end of the bid. Always remember the concept of bidding. You are speaking to your partner in the language of bid as simply as possible, as clearly as possible and also as quickly as possible. Would you add anything to that, Michelle? Yes, there was a point when I was learning bridge, I was fine when it was my partner and myself, but when everybody got involved, I used to get awfully confused. And I found one way to clear it was to think of an auction, as if I was going to Sotheby's and I was going to bid for something, and the guy sitting next to me was also raising his hand and trying to outbid me. Well, this is kind of how bridge works when you're in everybody's bidding, is that it depends who's got the most money, i.e. who's got the highest bid, and it's, it's kind of like a ladder. We start at the lowest bid, one club. Now, every bid is ranked above one club. It's clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades, no trumps. And we go from one to seven. So when, for example, I open one club and the opposition want to bid, they have to go to a higher rung of the ladder. When the bidding stops, somebody has made the highest bid. That bid becomes the contract. The bidder's side must take the number of tricks they have bid above six. So, as we saw earlier, to make a contract at the three level, declarer must take nine tricks. The trump suit is the last suit named by the highest bidder, or there may be no trumps. You may remember that Joan played in four hearts earlier. When you make a bid, you do it by naming a number and a suit, or no trumps. As you'll hear from Zia, you must try to do this with a poker face and an even tone. It's part of the rules and ethics and etiquette of bridge that it's necessary that your partner does not understand the message you're trying to give by the intonation and the volume of your voice. Now that's a little bit tough in the middle, in the beginning of bridge, and it's something that you have to be very, very careful to look after. Michelle, I mean, why don't you explain some of the situations we all know about that occur in houses every day of the week? Okay, the, well, the basic themes here is to submerge one's personality. I mean, there you go, you pick up a hand and it's got all these aces and kings and queens and you think, yay! And that's exactly what you want to say. But because bridge is a subtle game and the idea is to work out what people have and what's going on, not to be told by a, an expression of glee or someone smiling or looking depressed when they have no points, one has to keep a monotone. And not to say that you get bored or you're not enjoying yourself or you can't have fun, but just try and keep a little of a poker face so everybody can work it out. And then that's more of a mental exercise. I mean, it's actually quite funny because, I mean, I know a lot of people who will go out on the golf course, for instance, and they'll play golf and their ball will be in the rough and they wouldn't dream of moving that ball because they're very honest players and they're very ethical. But when they'd go after the game of golf into the clubhouse and sit on the bridge table, their opponent on their right will open a bid and they'll have five cards in that suit and they want to penalty double them and they'll look at them sternly and say, I double you and it'll be in a most uh, very embarrassing manner and it'll be as much cheating as moving that golf ball. But people don't know that because they're not really told it. I mean, I actually remember a story once of how I once played in a very important tournament with one of the top English players. And the person on my left opened a bid and I doubled for takeout and my partner thought for a while and then bid three spades or something like that and we had the hand went by and after the hand I turned around to him I said you know you had almost no points in your hand and yet you took a time to bid three spades why was that he says because it's as much giving illicit information to bid quickly when you know you have no problem as it is to bid particularly slowly when you have a problem. The correct procedure, and though it's not always possible, is to try and make your bids in tempo, without due inflection, and without your partner getting free in illicit information. I know it's hard, but it is a fact. 
And today, I've got some good news and bad news for you. The bad news is you're going to have to learn to bid like that. But the good news is I've got a friend of mine over who's going to give you a tip as to how easy it is. And that friend of mine is someone you'd like very much to hear from because it's none other than the great Omar Sharif. The first and most important tip I have for a bridge player is to be courteous and make your partner comfortable. For a very simple reason is that the more, the more your partner is comfortable, the better he'll perform. So try, even before you start the game, to make him feel good, to make him feel self-confident about his game. Don't make too many remarks to your partner because that will only make him play worse. Players value their hands in terms of high card points. They assign points to each on the card, four for an ace, three for a king, two for a queen, one for a jack. To open the bidding you need, say, 13 points. I dealt the cards, so I open the bidding. I have two kings and a queen, only eight points, less than the 13 necessary to open. Pass. I have 13 high card points. So I'll bid my strongest suit first. One speed. My partner does not have an opener, so I will pass. Pass. My partner has opened up one speed. Because I have six to nine points, my bid is one no trump, as I have a balanced hand. One no trump. It's obvious that the opposition have got the strength between the hands. Pass. My partner has indicated six to nine points, so I shall mention my second suit, two hearts. I have got nothing to say. Pass. I have nine points, which is maximum, and I also have four hearts as support for my partner. Three hearts. Pass. 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 Well, we just had the a very simple yet clean example of what bidding is all about. Basically, you bid your best suit first and your second best suit second. Your partner bids their hand and if you both do that accurately, you get to the best contract. Basically, bidding is exactly that from the beginning level to the highest level. And if people remember that, that the language of bridge is so simple, they would have many less problems than they actually do. What do you think, Michelle? Did you like their sequence? Yes, I, as you say, I thought it was very clear. This was just a simple example of bidding to a suit contract. The, as we know, there's majors and minors. The majors, heart spades. The minors, diamonds and clubs. Or there's no trump contracts. We, we decide whether we're going to be in a suit contract or a no trump contract. Yeah, well, I think we'll discuss next week perhaps more about that bidding. But meanwhile, you saw Cheryl's three heart bid. Now, that's what we call an invitational bid. Basically, she was giving an invitation to a partner to move on. And that's like a suggestion. And the way it all came about that people made invitational bid was through a guy called Eli Culbertson, who invented all these terms because he thought they're very, very easily identifiable by housewives who like the idea of suggestions and forcing bids and forcing passes and really made them happy. And Eli <laughs> Culbertson, I don't know if you know, was a great guy who really made bridge, put bridge on the map in the 1930s. He was a colorful, gorgeous American guy who was the biggest showman in the world. Mm -hmm. Actually, his wife was probably a better player than him, but he got more publicity. And he actually challenged the English to a big bridge match, the match of the century it was called, brought his team over from America and played. Him playing his system and the English playing their own system, actually, which was ACOL, which we're teaching today, but perhaps wasn't as good then as it is now. And he played and beat the English, but he caused such a rumpus while he was doing it that the whole world took interest in bridge. One of the kind of machinations he would do would come to a table with jam on his fingers and pick up the cards to infuriate his opponents. Another thing we'd do would never come on time, and one day when he had turned up on time, he was asked by his opponent, how did you come on time today? He said, I'm sorry, I think my watch was wrong. I was never meant to come on time. <laughs> so he was a glorious guy, and like him, there were other people who followed in his footsteps. Yeah, you say about these great players here, what do you think it takes to be a good player? What tip would you give for a beginner? Well, I actually think that <laughs> every expert has a different tip. 
In fact, the other day we talked to a few experts and asked them to give us some tips and they all gave us different answers, some of which we're going to let you see now. The most important single piece of advice is that basically the game is a game of focusing and identifying the problem you're dealing with rather than uh, attempting to memorize a bunch of rules uh, because the rules will not necessarily be applicable in most of the situations you try to apply them to whereas if you if you concentrate and think about what's going on that will always be a benefit to you. The most important thing for me is that in the early stages of learning how to play bridge and even later when you form a partnership no matter at what level respect that partnership trust your partner pay a lot of attention to what your partner sees bridge is very much like the world and people have attitudes and feelings about what they play that indicates a lot of who they are i think people like to be respected for that and if you care about that they'll give you their best the best advice i could give them and even today there's players that have been playing fifty years at the game still don't do it count every hand now I don't mean count it like an expert would count, but I mean when he looks at his hand and he's got five spades, four hearts, three dams and a singleton club, he should mentally say I've got five, four, three, one. Because that's the start of the process that enables him to count the other hands. And when he gets better he'll be able to count the hand on his left, his dummy and the hand on his right. And that is the secret of the game as far as I'm concerned as a card player. Yeah, so that means when you say count, you don't really mean that he has to know the exact number of cards. No. He should start understanding should the start shape of a hand. The shape of a hand. When he talks about a hand, he should say, I've got 5, 4, 3, 1, or I've got 5, 4, 2, 2, or I've got 6, 6, 1. And when he starts to do that, then he'll start to count all the suits that are on the table. So by counting his hand, which is 13 cards, he might say he's got 5, 5, 3. Right. Now he'll then progress to the spades, and he'll remember that the spades are actually 5, 4, 3, 1. Everything starts from 13, and everything starts from his own hand, and that's how to learn this game of bridge. And if you start doing that in the beginning, then you won't go wrong. Bridge is 99% concentration and paying attention to what you're doing. Now, uh, granted, you have to have certain talent for the game, but uh, basically the winners are those who are able to... Uh, compartmentalize their life and play bridge when they're playing bridge not worry about the problems of the world or other problems they may have in life and deal with the problem at hand it's very much a game of concentration and focus and intensity well I would advise them not to give up I mean I would like I would like to see them to try and not despair if something doesn't work out the way they hope and even if they're not doing well for some time they're just streaks of doing well and doing not so well to so just go on and Right. I'm sorry to say my real answer will surprise you, but I believe that bridge is an over and over game. Like I believe chess is an over and over game, like backgammon is an over and over game. And bridge is an over and the more hours you put in, provided you're looking for the right things, the better you'll become. Uh, my advice is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, married couples shouldn't play bridge together. Very bad. Yeah. Not even if one is as good as you? No, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a tip. If Boris says so, then you should all be listening. Now yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it, this is the best hand I've ever had in my life. I've got all the clubs. Seven clubs. Pass. Pass. I have 16 points. I have two aces. So there's no way that he should make this contract. Devil. There is no way I could go off in this contract. Redoubled. Pass. Pass. Well, I've just worked out that he's got 13 clubs because there's no way that he would double and redouble, which means he's going to have a grand slam. It'd be a mass of points. Seven spades. Next time I won't redouble, I'll keep my big mouth shut. Pass. 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 Oh, Zia, that was a fantastic hand. You must have fixed that hand. Well, I agree it was a bit of a fix. I, I can't deny it, but 
I did it actually to serve a purpose. It was interesting, but we spent today's telling about how you should always bid clearly, concisely, and get to the best contract as soon as possible. But bridge is an unbelievably fascinating game, and the fun of it is that, that every rule you make, there are exceptions. And today we saw how Wed Dermot, poor guy, I can't blame him, bid so quickly to the contract which everybody would when they start playing bridge, seven clubs, it was so obvious, mm -hmm. he ended up in a disaster because he didn't play seven clubs, he played seven spades. Well, he was defended against seven spades, which is not what he wanted to do at all. And that was the disaster. Now, what I want to show and why I love bridge and why you love bridge is because that hand is a hand where if an expert or a more experienced player played that hand, when he picked up his hand, instead of saying, oh my God, seven clubs, mm -hmm. he would have said, oh my God, I make seven clubs, but how are the opponents going to let me play there? Okay. The only way they let me play there is if I conceal the fact from them of the strength of my hand and make them think I'm not making seven clubs, not making. So what I would have done, now there's no clear answer, but I would have tried to disguise my hand. And perhaps what I would have done was to open something like five clubs. When you have a hand is distributed as this, somebody's going to bid because somebody is, everybody's void in clubs. Yeah. Maybe the second or the last in speed, maybe Cheryl would have said five spades. Mm -hmm. Now I would have bid six clubs. Mm -hmm. Maybe Cheryl would have said six spades and hopefully, finally, either I would play six clubs, which I would still prefer to playing than playing seven spades, or I would have got pushed to seven clubs, been doubled, never re-doubled to give away the game, and made the hand. And that is the adventure of a hand like that. Yeah. This is a lesson that I find that it's very difficult to teach someone who just started, but it's also very valuable. How to think ahead and to get to the best contract without the opponents knowing that you're automatically making it. Well, we've had a couple of lessons this week. So what can you give perhaps as the tip, that your tip for the week? I would say about Dermot on the last hand, even though he was a complete picture, and everybody was so excited that he was actually a bit of a naughty beastie because he did actually give his hand away with an expression of absolute glee. But one has to remember that really to submerge one's personality makes the game far more interesting and one has to use a more cunning element. Well, that's good. And I would just point out that for me, yes, bridge is a game where the simpler you bid, the more exactly you bid, the quicker you get to the best contract is the answer normally always there's an exception and when that exception comes I hope you can find it. Well that's all for this week and we'll see you next time.